What I want to try to do is to show how Turing's idea, which started off looking at a very specific problem, actually touched on a very general problem in nature um, and why for that reason it's been influential in fields far removed from the one he started looking at. So how is this different to what you normally do? It, it, well, I guess one of the ways in which it was different was that it was talking about science at a more sophisticated level. I guess a lot of the writing I do about science is for a general audience, um, whereas writing for Phil Trans, the likelihood is that you're writing for someone who already has a fairly sophisticated knowledge of science, although perhaps not of this particular topic. And in a way that was what was nice about it, because it meant that I could talk about the science in more depth. Most people know Alan Turing as a mathematician, but we're talking about a paper in a biological concept. Yeah, well, I guess um, Turing was someone who seemed to have been interested in many diverse areas. Um, you know, as a mathematician, he was looking to find ways of applying mathematics in areas where we might not expect it. And certainly one of them is how cells grow, how organisms grow, how bodies form. This is really what the paper was looking at, how they develop from an embryo. In some ways, what was new about this paper was that he was finding ways of talking about that process in mathematical terms. It's one of the, it's often sort of seen as one of the key texts in the field of mathematical biology, which was at that point hardly recognised as a subject at all. Some biologists and people interested in biology were just beginning to realise this sort of messy process of life can sometimes be understood to some extent um, as, a, as a mathematical process by applying mathematical principles. And this one in particular, um, Turing was interested in how it is that creatures like us, organisms, develop um, the complex shapes and patterns that we have from something that starts off very, very simple, just a fertilised egg. And so what Turing says in the paper is that it start, as it, when it starts off, it's really just like a sphere. It just has the symmetry of a sphere, perfect symmetry, in fact. So how does it get from that to something that has limbs and organs and so forth? And looked at that way, it becomes a mathematical problem. How do you, in effect, how do you lower the symmetry of this system so that some, you know, air, some directions and some parts of it are different from others. Um, so that's really what the paper is about. How, in sort of technical terms, how you break the symmetry of the fertilised egg to create an organism. But why is this paper important in biology? Well, it turns out that the problem Turing was initially looking at, how uh, a, an egg develops, that that is in some ways a more complicated one um, th from the idea that he originally had, but, but the, the ideas that he developed seem to have more application um, in the uh, question of how animals get their markings, things like giraffes, tigers, leopards, zebras, because here you've, you've got the same kind of problem of how a pattern develops, um, you know, where there's no obvious prescription for it. Really the problem he's looking at is this much more general one of how you get pattern um, some kind of order from something that is just uniform, that has no, uh, no, no part of it is any different from any other. That's something that happens throughout nature. So it happens, for example, when wind is blown across a desert and you know it's just blown at random. Every part of the system it looks like any other, but out of that somehow come sand ripples or dunes that have a pattern to them. So that symmetry again is broken. Um, but it's also something that you can find in social systems, in systems that, that humans build. For example, you know, looking at things like crowd behaviour or traffic behaviour. The paper's from 1952. How is it different to papers that we might read today? One of the first things I noticed was that there were so few references. I think there were maybe only six or so. In some respects, the fact that there were so few of them is a reflection of the times when you know, it didn't matter quite so much to, to list all your precedents, but it was really also a reflection of the fact that no one had thought about the problem this way before. So I began my discussion by looking at the references, which seems like maybe an odd place to start, but it seemed to me that that was a reflection of how groundbreaking it was, that Turing had found a new way to talk about a problem and that there really wasn't anything you know, to be found previously that uh, had looked at it this way.